Korka is a serene village nestled in a small island separated from the mainland by a strait. The world forgot to name. Its inhabitants are mostly fishermen. A few are cattle grazers too. Boat ride across the strait is the only mode of transport to the mainland. Nice. Budugu, the boatman, ferries people, cattle and bicycles across the season, across the strait in his boat for a living. The remoteness and the lack of connection to the mainland has served him well. Yes, yes. He has a family of five. His two daughters are away studying in a city college and dream of corporate job and studies. His ailing mother and wife complete his family. He is a boatman. He ferries people, cattle and bicycles across the strait in his boat for a living. Right? Budugu sent his daughters to study in the city as there is only one school in Korkai run by an NGO. The NGO prepares the village kids for higher studies. For those who cannot go to cities, the NGO teaches them about the virtues of the local way of life. And the NGO says, hey, I'll, I'll gear you up for city life. In case that doesn't fall in place, a job is not there, then you get, uh, you, you do the best with what you have got here locally. But even the NGO is geared to get them for higher studies. So nice. A uh, beautiful enclave, a beautiful pot where it's a small island, people are living probably one of our romanticized notions of an idyllic life. And so it would be nice to go and visit it and see it, but we'll be bored shitless if you had to live there. Right? That kind of place, nice, pleasant place. And our man is the, is the, is the boatman. The, the boatman is super crucial because it's very clear that boat ride across the strait is the only mode of transport. Probably that's why the island is also cut off. There is a bridge. It wouldn't be cut off. It will be more integrated with the mainland. This part is important. I'll come back to this. Budugu is a member of the village panchayat that runs the village administration. At Korkai, hardly anyone remembers the local MLA or MP. Probably a nice small uh, village. Interestingly, the local MLA visited last week and informed the islanders of major changes planned for the region. Nice. Urgent construction of a bridge connecting the island to the mainland and real estate development. I see. She announced that the island will become a well-known ecotourism destination in the state. Nice. She stressed that the local livelihood dependent on fortune to the sea might enjoy the certainty in minimum wages meted out by the eco-resort owners. Nevertheless, some villagers fear that the bridge will irreversibly change their lives and livelihoods. I see. So this is an island, it's cut off the typical development which is uh, retaining our, our roots conflict. And so somebody, somebody or other is always going to be worried. But they are dependent on fortune to the sea, they are cut off, they are they're, they're being linked to the mainland is not the worst thing to happen for them. It is going to become a well-known ecotourism destination, somebody else is bringing the capital, building it up. And working in that place could be a nice wage earner thing for it. So it is built in that the village lifestyle or economic fortunes will, should take an upturn if this, this works out. And especially given in the context of this, when I read it for the first time, I completely missed this. And there is one NGO that runs a school. The NGO prepares the, prepares the village kids for higher studies. For those who cannot go to the cities, the NGO teaches them about the virtues of local way of life. The NGO is gearing them in many ways for living in the city. So there is clear acceptance and understanding of the fact that, look, this is not living in the village in this way. This is not the preferred notion. Arman Budubu is, is, is living this. He's probably he's a member of the panchayat. He's, he's, he's got the only guy or the only mode of transport he has taken it. He probably knows everybody in the village. Is some kind of an authority on the boat riding thing, but uh, he's clearly sent two of his daughters to the mainland. He knows the future is in the mainland. He knows that for his daughters, uh, the economics of the village is not what he wants for them. He knows that look, I'm part of the village, but the next gen goes to the cities. He's he's already thinking like that rather wisely, and so so he may like this. His ailing mother and wife might continue here. He might have a livelihood. He might live there, but. Even he is thinking, hey, mainland is where the future is, which is why he sent his daughters there. When I read it for the first time, I didn't see how the NGO is gearing them for jobs. And I didn't recognize and accept the fact or, or, or pick the fact that Arman has sent his two daughters there. 
Budugu fears that the proposed bridge will leave him jobless and is determined to do something about it. He wants to gather effective support in order to get the construction of the proposed bridge delayed. Right? So, which of the following will be the most feasible option for Budugu to gather effective support? Right? So, it is a, we have to recognize that there is a personal element to this. He is going to lose a chunk of his livelihood. He is a boatman and once a bridge comes, the boatman probably is redundant. And why would you take a boat when you can just cycle across or take a car across or bike across or whatever across? Right? So, the village is no longer going to be at the mercy of a few boat rides to be connected with the mainland. It could be a dramatic change and improvement for their lives, for being integrated with their larger economy. But it is going to render the boatmen jobless. Right? So, what should he do? Partner with the local NGO and campaign that the developments will ruin the local way of life. So, one is uh, partner with the local NGO, so you have support. In campaign, the developments will ruin the local way of life. So make it strong, say, ruin it. I'm not thinking right now to answer whether it is good for Budugu to take the decision. It's very clear. He wants to stop it. It is in his personal interest that this does not happen because his livelihood will be gone. What is his most feasible option? I like this. Okay. Get a resolution passed by the panchayat that the bridge will ruin the local way of life. Very powerful, very strong. A resolution passed by the panchayat. People have never seen the MLA or MP. They trust the panchayat. They are their local governance thing linked to governance, administration, uh, public sector, everything. Who are the rulers, so called, is through this. I like this also. Suspend his boat services till the villages start supporting his cause. <sighs> this is the MLA is saying this. He has got some sway. Is a crucial guy, but this is like blackmail. He's offering the one service that connects village to mainland. His daughters are there. He knows what the mainland offers. The big economic opportunity is probably there. So hey, no, this is blackmail. Not a fan. The villagers very likely will go on a backlash path rather than understanding and empathizing with it. You want to get people on board feeling for you, not saying look, I'll hold you to ransom. Inform the environmental experts in the nearby cities that the strait is home to rare fish frogs and turtles and so again this is interesting as an approach but it is um, it is gathering support in unconventional ways uh, typically the preference is to do this more straightforward thing then garner surrounding support so some, something doesn't work for you say this doesn't work for me it'll ruin our way of life and then garner support in other means there is because the, the, the in nearby city, the strait is home to rare fish, frogs and turtles. The bridge may not end up destroying them, could be there. And this is not probably the primary issue. Their way of life is probably the bigger thing to complain about than, than flora and fauna. Form a boat rowers association and sit on a hunger strike to protest a proposed bridge. Um, it's there, it's an option, but it's again uh, it's a more weaponized form of this. And so, we're basically saying, look, we are here till the, if the bridge is going to construct it, we are going to make your life miserable till then. And so, it is, uh, it can take a form where it is antagonistic, where people, where, where you say, look, we, I will hold you to ransom. I will not let this bridge come here uh, because the rowers, we rowers, we need to be here and therefore we'll hold you to ransom. So, both of these are little dicey, not that comfortable. Between these two, partner with the local NGO and campaign that the developments will ruin the local way of life. Yeah, say that look, look, we are, we are protected, we have our tradition, we have our method. But the local NGO seems to be saying, I'm preparing them for life in the city. If that doesn't happen, then I'll do this. So chances are the local NGO is not, is rather happy. The students can learn, study, go and get jobs in the city. The, the integrating with the city economy is probably a more important thing than protecting, given that I don't get a job in the city is when I learn to appreciate the local way of life. So I'm not so sure that will happen. Whereas this, passed by the panchayat, for everybody, the panchayat is an anchor point. It's, they don't know their local MP, MLA, MP. For them, panchayat is the, the seat of government, seat of power. If that passes, then then it, it, can, it can garner people around. I would go for this. But a nice, little bit, only a little bit between A and B. I prefer B to A. The local MLA is worried about the resistance to the project. So, our man Budugu has probably created a, a movement. 
This project, like her other successful projects in nearby villages, was supposed to garner a significant amount of funding. Moreover, it would make her the face of development in the state, perhaps even would land her a ministerial birth. Her own ambitions are uh, good. However, Buduku's activism, so her man has been active, has cast the project in a bad light among the popular minds, also, the higher ups, okay? and popular minds among the people. The MLA wants to protect her pro development image. So, somewhere she is pro development, she is good, she has. Uh, She's created projects which have worked for people, which have brought in economic development. She's the one who's seen as the, the person who can, uh, who can push through trade, jobs, employment, improve lives of people. Right? Whereas the activism has, uh, has, has, has suggested that she's running roughshod over, uh, over, over people's way of life in the name of economic growth. She doesn't want that. And so she's, she's very keen that her develop, pro-development image be maintained. Uh, that's her route to going higher in her career. And she, she, she's been the face of development. She doesn't want to lose that. Okay. So, which of the following is the best course of action for the MLA? Invite the village panchayat for a discussion on a possible compromise solution. Okay. I like this. I like this because several times the exam choices love this. Look, two people are fighting, bring them together, have a chat. Two people have difference of opinion bring them together, have a chat. So the bring them together, have a chat has a natural uh, sweet spot attached to it. Bring them together. And so they're talking about something, bring them together. Publicize widely that the project will improve the socio-economic condition of the island. I like this as well, because there's a perception issue here. She wants to be known as pro-development. The activists are saying it is, it is, it is going to ruin our way of life. So if she says, look, it's not going to ruin your way of life, it's going to improve the lifestyle, it's going to make you wealthier, it's going to get you jobs. What have you got by being, being in this place uh, where all of you, you're sending your children to study somewhere else. You're going once a week, every day, up and down, twice a week or whatever frequency, you're going to the city to sell your wares, get your jobs, complete your projects, all of them. So the, your, your socio-economic improvement is more important than then, then having some uh, saying our way of life is ruined. On top of it, there's going to be ecotourism, you're going to get jobs, you're going to be, you can go to get great jobs here. So the lifestyle improvement and wealth improvement and job improvement and socioeconomic improvement will far overshadow anything else. That's her pitch. She needs to sell that. So this also I like. Both are good. Appoint a task force to find an alternative land nearby for the project. That's basically it will say, look, this, didn't, this thing didn't work. I'm throwing in the towel. Budugu has won this round. I'll go somewhere else. Then she has to reposition the new project as a major economic development thing. She's conceding defeat on this. And whereas it might not even be the thing. She should stand her ground and say, this is good for you guys. This is good for this village. It's every, every likelihood that our man has overplayed his activism card. He has something to lose. He's playing it. He's very clear. He has sent his daughters there. This project is probably meaningful. Why should you leave your seat the ground and do that? Not such a fan of this. Discredit Budugu in a public meeting by announcing that he's putting his interest over and above the village development. That's probably what she will do. But you can't say this. You can't say he'll go for an op option, which is discredit Budugu in a public meeting. So it's, it's one, it's, it's, uh, it's taking the very aggressive humiliation element into it. And discredit is a very strong word. Uh, elaborate the virtues of this project and say that positives are way more than the negatives. Yeah, that's nice. That's middle ground seeking, accentuating what are the good things about this, what the development can come about. Discredit the other guy publicly, too strong, the wording is too strong. No, no, I don't want to do that. Create a fisherman and boat rowers cooperative in the island and donate, donate generously to it. He is like giving them money and buying them off. The activism is around their thing. I would rather convince the rest of the village that it's a massive socio-economic opportunity for them rather than go and pay off these guys and get them on board. This is basically pay off the guys who are the most affected. Pay them off and, and buy them onto your side. Not my most preferred option. Okay. Between these two, A and B. Uh, invite the village. Uh, this is this is the typical collaborate, bring everybody together, get them to the seat and have a discussion. 
this is publicized by the project will improve the socio economic condition of the land there is one thing that cast the project in a bad light among the popular minds so the higher ups or in people's mind the project has been um, positioned as something that is a negative so she probably has to win public opinion before anything else so the panchayat's minds have to come under pressure based on people around them saying why are you saying this they i understand that i can get a job i can go to city easily the travel time is crashed the, the, the local economy will improve why are we saying no to this people should come back and say so she wants this has been cast in bad light among the people she needs to address that which is why this is probably shades that between a and b it is very close especially because a is your blanket umbrella option but get everybody to talk we'll do this but before she gets people to talk she has to get popular buy in so publicize the virtues of it and then go for it do a b and then come to a that will probably be meaningful cuz by that time the panchayat would have heard from so many people saying why are you guys putting a throne pant banner in the works this is good for us why are you letting an opportunity go by to the next village it's crazy get it and that will happen only after a buy in has been got so b shades a a little bit as the project gets delayed budugu becomes a well known social activist with a lot of followers nice when pragati his elder daughter finishes her education and start looking for employment a few known corporates refuse her a job because of her father's anti development champion and the why why you should do this very dicey territory and so the one he is an activist doesn't cast her in any light she she's her own person and so if i'm interviewing somebody i won't say your father is an activist i won't do this it seems like a very silly thing to do but hey that's a hand we have been dealt as deal with it which of the following options best communicates to the corporate that pragati has an identity of her own and so she has to do something where she says she is her own person not her father's daughter right go all out on social media to explain how her father's activism is misconstrued by certain corporates and so this is nice but i i, really, I didn't like this go all out on social media but and it's misconstrued by certain corporates she wants to communicate to them that she is her own person but if she goes and says and writes a lot of posts and does videos saying look these corporates don't get it my father is actually standing for the right thing chances are she comes out as someone who's on the father's camp not someone with an identity of her own more importantly they are peeved with the anti development stand they're going to say she also has an anti development stand so it's not it's not helping her cause of landing a job and so so no 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 stop using her last name in her job application i don't know whether that will help i don't know whether budugu is associated with a specific last name that's how they are identifying her any wish way saying look i i'll disown this part of me and therefore play play my cards like that and get a job no 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 showcase on social media the accolades and awards she received in her college all right all right this says nothing about Uh, the development stand nothing about uh, what our father's activism but basically says look i am an excellent candidate i'm very good you know what i'm doing so it, it helps build this identity of our own thing while side stepping the whole activism social economic uh, the development versus natural habitat angle and activism thing side stepping the whole thing look i'm really good discuss in a social media post why she supports the proposed development in her island village this could be interesting it could be a good avenue to say hey i really like this um my i don't know what the activism activists have in mind but i really like this and so i have only one issue is she there be going directly against what her father stands for uh, and he probably has his, his point of view this is an option where she's she's throwing in her entire uh, weight behind the corporates and kind of saying look father's got it wrong effectively that's an issue that start a blog and update it regularly with views on current affairs right again an option very much like c not directly focusing on the problem but saying hey uh, i'll talk about different 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 current affairs oh, this can establish that she has an identity of her own she is not her father's daughter she is not ready to just to the line but between these two this is showcasing awards and accolades which probably shades it a little bit 
C over E. This is blank. Not an update. Talk about current affairs. Talk about two Olympics. Talk about football. Talk about something else. But this talks about, hey, I have received all this. I am good. I am capable. So this is more worthy of landing a job than this. And this is very blank. Between these two, this is against her father. In a bit to carve out her own name. I don't think she should choose an option which is directly against what her father is doing. I don't know whether that will be seen in good light. Therefore, C, but it's probably the question that I was kind of least convinced with. Not, not, I find all options to be a little warm. I think this, this stand from corporate saying, look, this is, uh, we won't select you because your father is an activist to be observed. And therefore, finding a strategy against it to be rather on weak ground as a question itself. I could say no to these. Between CDE, I was torn. In another day, I might have gone with one of these. So I'm not really happy with this. But the back working, I can say, hey, this is probably shades the other. Raghubir, a reputed doctor, practices medicine in a tier 3 city. He owns an imported SUV, which he bought 10 years ago, using his hard-earned savings of nearly 5 years. Initially, he used to take it for long rides. But for the last 6-7 years, he only commutes to his clinic a 10-minute drive from his home. It's typical, it's probably taken a step back from his wild driving days. The SUV has been his proud possession, but it demands high maintenance. He bought 10 years ago. Obviously, maintenance costs have crept up. Also, the diesel guzzling SUV does not comply with the new emission norms being introduced in Tire 1 and Tire 2 cities. Nice. Of late, a few newspapers reported that the new emission norms may be introduced in Tire 3 cities as well. This news has worried Rakupir. And so, I think it's up for a change. Generally, cars... You should, at the end of 10 years, you should probably say, hey, I need to figure out a way. I need to, need to change it. He's had a, it has, it has been a big deal for him. It's one of those proud possessions. He's with the entire three city, a giant SUV is bound to uh, raise eyebrows. So, so he's got that. So he's been happy with it. But for the last six, seven years, he's practically not uh, given it, put it through the ringer. He's been low key about it. Right? Probably, let's go to Raghubir is afraid that once the new emission norms are rolled out, he might not be able to use his SUV anymore. Which of the following options will best put Raghubir at ease with using his SUV for some more time? Important, some more time, not forever. And so, he's worried. Tire 1, Tire 2 are beginning to get these norms. Tire 3, maybe, maybe, if somebody tells him, look, uh, keep it Raghubir, at least 3-4 years, we don't have to worry, he's happy. And so, he's not looking to have it forever. But hey, three more. Then he has a window to sell it to somebody, a, a window to reassess the changes, something something he can do. Okay. His mechanic assures him that the new norms will not be introduced anytime soon. That's reassuring. And so, mechanic assures him. So, I, I like this. But somehow I feel like his mechanic is the authority in, the, uh, in, in putting this together. I don't know if he's the authority in knowing the norms and new news. And so, mechanic is, is, the, is if something... If he says this vehicle will last four more years, there's no issues, the spare parts are good, I'll take him on his word. But if he says the norms won't be introduced two years, three years, the, the information is good, but I don't know that the authority is good. As a sought after doctor, all the law enforcement officials are his patients. Which is good, <laughs> but straight away I'm saying this is not a choice, right? It's basically saying, even problem has to be cutting, no, no problem. If the norms change, and there is a mechanism to say, you can get away with it because you know the, 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 the traffic inspector. I don't like that option. Right? So, so straight away, no. So this is an easy no. You can't pick an option where you say, look, I know the inspector. Cut lane. No, no, no. That doesn't work. Right? So, the city has many other SUVs which are as old as this. Reassuring. Reassuring. In the sense that, look, I have company. Not reassuring. In the sense that, look, this won't come. It, it, it is one of those things where, like, uh, like I don't have, there's a power shut down, the power goes off in my house, I look out and there's a cracker. The whole, whole street is gone. And it feels nice. But it doesn't actually say anything about whether it's going to come in 10 minutes or 2 hours or 3 hours. So all of us could be in trouble. So it's all right uh, in, a, in a kind of mystery loves company way, but not too great. Doesn't really reassure me. Right? So, his lawyer friends in the city recently bought non-compliant SUVs from Tire 2 cities. So the, the Tire 2, if it once it went out, so the Tire 2 guys are looking to sell. The lawyer guys know that they can get it as a, at a good price. They are buying it and taking it. And so the emission norms are not going to affect Tire 2 cities, Tire 3 cities that quickly. It's the inference here and here. 
So I like this as well. Non-compliant SUVs are still playing in tier 2 cities. This you don't like because there is a compliant expectation. Once the norm is there, it's basically saying even though there is an expectation, we can get away with it. Similar to this. Even though it's an expectation, you can get away with it because you know people. This is on non-compliance is not taken seriously. This is you know the people, they will not take your non-compliant seriously. So B is really bad. But E also is not a preferred thing. They might suddenly start taking it seriously. It's a, the norm is a norm. Law is a law. The, it's legally, it's in shady territory. So I would push out B and E. I would keep C as well behind because A and D are better. Between this, both seem to suggest that the norms are not going to come in a hurry. This comes from a mechanic. This comes from lawyer friends. I'm taking lawyer friends because they're talking about a legal norm being implemented tire 1, tire 2, tire 3. Every chance that they have a better handle on when it might come, how it might come, how long it might take than the mechanic. If somebody says, look, your vehicle should work for another four years, and the mechanic says and my lawyer friend says, I'm taking the mechanic's word. This set of things being implemented in tire 3 cities is going to take three more years. I'm listening to the lawyers. Anya, Raghubi's daughter, works in a metro city. She is concerned about private transport emissions and is unhappy with her father's diesel guzzling SUV. Though she wants her father to be more environmentally responsible, she is aware that any drastic suggestion might attract strong resistance. Probably tell my, my daughter this. She can't come and tell me, look, she changed her car. So maybe she can. She can get away with murder. But I'm saying I see the thing, the grand patriarch. He will listen to his daughter, but it has to be a nudge rather than a directive. Right. Hence, she wants a solution acceptable to Raghubir that gently dissuades him from using his SUV on a daily basis. And so, very nicely worded. And so, she understands. She wants to, I won't say she wants to manipulate him. Uh, she, I won't say she wants to play him. But she wants to nudge him rather than direct him, rather than just order him around. So, Gently dissuade him. Well, I like that phrase. Gently dissuade him. She wants to almost create a mechanism where he realizes, hey, I've got to be environmentally conscious. I don't need to lug around this SUV all my life. I can find a, another alternative. And, I, and, and, and he should kind of go towards that almost as if it were his own journey there. Which is one nudge, one throat from his daughter. Which of the following actions by Anya will best dissuade Raghubir from, from using his SUV on a daily basis? Take away Raghubir's SUV to the metro city and gift him a new SUV. Uh, all good, but as SUV to SUV, I don't know whether it's solving the environmental transport emission problem. And it's like a hard press. Take away, take away. Just take it away and then put in, like, I'll solve your problem for you. No, 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 that doesn't work. You want to gently dissuade him because she is aware that any drastic suggestion is likely to meet resistance. It's drastic, as drastic as it comes. Straight away, no. <coughs> Give Raghubir a small petrol car and convince him to sell his SUV. It's all right. I like this. My, 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 my small issue is, is you gift him a car and then send him, try to sell him. So, so it's almost like you're taking the decision for him and then it's telling him, look, you sell the SUV. Whereas this says gently dissuade him. It's not gentle. It's like you have another car, why don't you use it? So I'm taking the decision for you. So the, the, the outcome is well done, is what you want, it's going to be achieved. But <coughs> uh, any drastic suggestion, gently dissuade. In that part, it's slightly on the back foot, but I still like it. Request Raghubir to use public transport for his daily commute and use the SUVs parity. So, nice. So the environmental thing will work. Uh, uh, she wants a solution that gently dissuades him from using his, his SUV. But he's anyway using it. If you look at it, it says he's anyway using it practically only for a. Uh, he only commutes to his clinic at 10 minute drive from his home. He's practically using the vehicle only for 20 minutes. And so, he, I think, therefore, the solution cannot be for. Uh, cannot incorporate something which says use the SUV sparing. How much more sparingly can you use it? You take it. Chances are he can't. He doesn't have a public transport option to his clinic. He's going to use it. And if this his current usage is making you unhappy, this is not going to be drastically lower because he's already using it only sparingly. So I think any suggestion should include the idea that SUV not exist. 
already using it rather sparingly He's using it for a 10 minute drive per day 10 minute up 10 minute down how much pleasure can you use it so if you want to dissuade him it has to be not there therefore it's a little bit iffy ask his mechanic to explore if the suv can be retrofitted with a cng kit an out there suggestion explore the opportunity then it will be an suv it will still be a complication a tire 3 city fine cng thing i don't know if it really solves the problem it is uh, it, it probably the 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 the, the gas guzzlingness fuel cost angle might, might come down but i don't know whether it's environmentally that friendly i don't know if that is it is really viable so lukewarm not really a fan and telling asking a mechanic to explore is like neither here nor there i part right early and i work well ask ragubir secretary to ferry him to the clinic daily in her car except for the weekends so so this again i like because it says look have somebody uh, remove the daily commute from SUV onto something else in a way where it is not inconveniencing him. So he has a car, she, she, he or she, secretary, uh, she, secretary brings her car, takes him. Over a period of time, he'll probably realize that he probably doesn't need the car because the daily commute is covered, you can, you can give it off. So this is, a, so this, this does not inconvenience him in any way, replaces the SUV with another mode of transport. Let's him have his SUV for that one, two days where he might feel like he needs it. Therefore, after a while, he'll say, look, I don't even need this because I'm using it only once per week. I'll find a simpler car. So this I like. So because these two are good, I'm going to eliminate ACD. Gift Raghubir a small petrol car and convince him to sell his SUV. Uh, ask Raghubir secretary to ferry him to the clinic. I was really torn. I would have gone for this or this. Both are this close. The right answer is this. Uh, because this is this is still I think a little forceful get a car take the decision for him whereas they're very explicitly told to gently dissuade him get a car one day finally instead of this big car there's also a small car so it's almost like let's use this small car it's not gently dissuading him nudging him to it as much as taking the decision and, 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 and grabbing onto that shift which is why not this but this so ease out whatever the SUV is doing get it done through another tool which is basically the secretary ferrying him in her car therefore the SUV suddenly does not get used even the sparing level it is currently used it's out and hope for the best and so this works best the new emission norms are about to get implemented in tire three cities and Raghubir city will follow suit shortly so SUV has a kind of death notice marked on it it's out hence Raghubir starts exploring options of buying an electric vehicle he lists the following factor that will guide him on buying an electric car. Nice. So, it's moving with the times. Nice. EVs within Raghubir's budget can cover his daily commute, but not the long rides. What are we supposed to do? Which one is best? Or the above listed factors have been arranged in a decreasing order of influence. Which of the following works? Sorry about that. So, we need to arrange these in decreasing order. Right? So, EVs within Raghubir's budget can cover his daily commute, but not the long rides. Uh, it's a factor, but to be honest, the last 5, 6, 7 years, he's not been using his SUV for long rides. He used to do that for the first few years, but the last 5 years he's not been really doing it. He's been taking it to his office and coming back. So, it may not be a criterion for him. He's practically looking at a car to go to a clinic and come back. So, I don't think long rides are in his list of things. And so, not high maybe maybe i'll put it at a six out of ten factor okay. i'm checking some number in others will be higher or lower a new suv electric suv in the market within his budget nearly has the same look and feel of his presentation i like this and it's one it's electric and it's suv so the, the the presence matters to him he doesn't want to downgrade to a small car he's probably a good guy who's used to being seen in an suv it is within his budget. I feel like this phase within his budget because he spent five years saving up to buy an SUV. So if it's out of whack, and then it becomes a tricky decision. So it is within his budget, SUV to SUV, nearly has the same look and feel of his present SUVs. Practically, I live, I'm living my same life, except it's electric, less polluting, it's my same budget. Rather, I mean, it's, my, it's in my budget. Rather happy with this. This scores high, like an eight or nine on ten. EVs cannot be driven beyond a speed of 70 km per hour. 
you know, it's such a big crucial factor. Why? Because he's not using it for his big cross-country India rides. He's not. That much is clear. He's not using it for those cross-country rides. That much is super clear. So, he's currently using it for his clinic and back. So, he's rather happy with the uh, with a short haul commute, we are only looking for that. In a tire 3 city from home to clinic, it's probably never going to hit 70 km per hour. So, therefore, this also will be like a 6 out of 10. I don't want to take a decision on whether this is 6 or 7 and 7 or 6. My 9s and 8s are separate, my 6s are separate. We will take care after that. New charging stations on the main highway connecting a city to the closest metro city may come up in another year. This is important because at some point of time I go out having an EU EV vehicle. I'll want this, I'll want the reassurance that I can charge on the way. Otherwise, my range gets severely contracted. Important criteria. Probably 7.5 or 8 out of 10. Why lower? Because I'm not doing big intercity commutes with my SUV. I'm looking for a vehicle for in-city commute. That is clear. But it's an important criterion, so I'm giving it probably a little bit more than these two. The only shop selling EVs in a city is ready to trade in Raghubir's SUV at a reasonable price. Oh, I love this. I love this. I have an SUV. I want to replace this. I want. I don't want two cars. So I want to trade in. The guy can't trade in my vehicle. I have to find an alternate buyer. It's a pain in the neck. So wherever this is going to be accepted, wherever somebody takes my vehicle and gives me another one, I'm liking that. Right. So I want Q and T to be high, P and R to be low. We look at something. Q T to be high. P R to be low. Q is very low, not this. Q T, Q T, Q T, yeah, this is fine, but not this. And I like Q more than T. Do I? A new electric SUV within his budget nearly has the same thing, it will get traded. Q slightly more than T. In R and P lesser S in the middle. Yeah, this is S right at the end, this is S in the beginning. Both of these have S, this RSP and PSR, all right. QT and TQ, we compare R and P and see which is more important between R and P. Both are not super important. I'm not that worried about it. Between Q and T, I like QT better. Q better than T. So, TQ, RSP, no. QT, PSR, I like that. This is TQ, RPS, no. S, I think, will be not the last. So, not this. It's between these two. Q slightly more than T, right in the budget is a very juicy statement. I really like that. My budget. That, that, that just, given that it is my budget, I can also trade in my car. I can trade in my car, but then the budget is later. No, no, no. Budget is the first criteria, and then trading in the car is a bonus after that. Therefore, Q more than T, I would go towards that. Dosa stall. Dilip Dosa sells dosas in front of an upscale hospital at a city in Punjab. He only sells two varieties of dosas, plain for 25 and masala for 40. Nice. His dosa stall is popular amongst the hospital staff members who mostly hail from South India and form his core clientele. Nice. They frequent his stall during office hours as they find his dosas to be reasonably priced. Though the hospital staff members can visit the upscale food court on the top floor of the hospital, they prefer his stall for breakfast and lunch and even for occasional evening snacks. The daily sale volume varies between 300 and 400 dosas, in which the demand for masala dosas around 50 to 60 percent. Half his dosas are masala dosas, slightly more than that. 300 to 400 is priced very reasonably, 25 and 40. His clientele is, uh, is popular among staff members because they are from South India, uh, but he is in Punjab. So, very interesting set. And he is from Punjab. So, chances are the general audience is not up, 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 up the alley. Whereas this is natural clientele is, uh, is uh, people who already know him, people who visit may not be comfortable with South Indian Paris, especially outside. Uh, whereas this is his, is his home ground, the, the hospital clientele is his home ground. Nice. Nice. Do this. One day leap while walking through the hospital food court, sees a vacant spot. He wonders if he can shift his stall to that spot. Which of the following information will dissuade him the most from shifting his stall to the food court. Right? On inquiry, he learned that the cheapest dish in the food court is priced at Rs. 200, which is nice. So, if he comes there, either he will be super low priced or he can amp up his price and make money. And so, this is probably good news. The food court has no other stall selling dosa. That's obviously good news. He will be the only guy delivering dosa variety should score. 
the food court closes by 10 30 pm whose current stall is open till midnight uh, 10 30 pm is late enough if the price point is high enough it should be fine i don't think it's a it's a deal breaker um, I, I think the giant proportion of the clientele and new clientele you can get is going to be there so, and so i don't think it's an issue i don't think this will dissuade him too much all the restaurants in the food court except the fast food stalls sell north indian meal during lunch time everybody does north indian meal so if he finds this out then he's going to be happy so when hardcore north indians want dal chawal and roti sabji all the time if there's one restaurant that does those us you're going to go there right so it's an easy thing so i think b and d especially uh, are part of the good news b d it's not dissuade him will encourage him Right. The food court sees a daily footfall of about 5,000 people. Arman get 300 to 400. 5,000 is a sizable number. It's a large number. Um, I don't think that will dissuade him. 5,000 people coming there. He can say, look, 10% eat, eat from my stall every day. And you've got it done. Got it made. I won't say it's an astoundingly high number. But it's high enough. I don't think I'll be dissuaded. So I'm in trouble. And so I want to rethink this. I want to, I want to figure out. Uh, what might dissuade him? So the cheapest dish is priced at 200. Is that a problem? Is that a problem? He is a 25 buck, 40 buck guy. He goes there, he'll be an extreme low priced competitor. But there might be a food stall cost attached to it, which you have to pay rent to the hospital. Or he might be conveying just the wrong message. Sometimes when you go to a food court and the bunch of guys selling at 300 bucks and one guy selling at 60 bucks. Then sometimes it's just wildly popular or it becomes too niche, too low priced. It just stands out in an, in an awkward way. You probably don't want to do that. Fine. So I want to come back to this because of the message it conveys, because he cannot send a 25 buck, 40 buck thing right there. It may become, may become tricky and it's, it's, it's a completely different market. Our man is happy making the dosa, giving it and getting a local, local clientele, doing the whole thing there. You probably expect a different style of ambience and cutlery and service and all that. And that's probably not his territory and probably not something that he can deliver at 25 and 40. But he'll be expected to deliver at 200. So from the local friendly neighborhood, uh, nice guy, 25, 40, dosa, masal dosa guy, he might suddenly need to reposition himself. Uh, dramatically, it's not a stall, just a location difference. It's a location, branding, style, ambience, presentation, pitch, positioning. Everything is different from from going, being on the basement and a side hustle to being in the food court. He, he'll probably need to dramatically change himself. And that might be an issue. So that might dissuade him. The price is very compelling. Who doesn't want your average price point is 35 bucks and your the, the slowest price point is 200 bucks. You're one sixth of that. So you're, you're flying. You're saying, look, I can kill this. I can make a killing in this place. So the, this number is very juicy. But what comes with, with that expectation from there, from the people? So he might stand out. So you, you, you go to a, 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 a wonderful five star hotel. You don't expect to have a dosa corner there which sells dosa at 80 bucks. You don't. And if somebody is selling it at 70 bucks or 60 bucks there, like maybe something's wrong here. It's funny. So he might worry about his entire positioning in that place. That might be an issue. Uh, this is not dissuading. So these three I'm happy to eliminate. I'm between A and C. But this is 10.30 p.m. midnight. I don't know whether that's a dramatic. Obviously, hospitals are through the year, through the day places. But it's just normal clientele is uh, so his regular nurses and, and doctors. And also the, the exam makes it the, the, the outline makes it clear they come for breakfast and lunch and for evening snacks so he's never really had a banker dinner business or a midnight business he's open but i don't think this doesn't suggest that a chunk of his business happens late in the night so so i wouldn't worry too much about it therefore i'll go for this because it's unwittingly even though the price point is higher from 25 to 40, if it were the lowest price point were 70, then he can say, look, 70. I can take my 25 to 40, my 40 to 40, 50, and then get it for 40% upgrade in prices and spend slightly more, make the place spruced up a little bit, upgrade myself a little bit, and then I'm in the game. But 200, I, I, I'm not in the game. I'm going to a whole new business. That might be slightly worrisome. You might either stick out as a sore thumb, which is a problem, 
or it's a whole new upgrade which you may not be ready for. Therefore, I will go for A. Very, 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 very little in it between A and C. B, D and E eliminate themselves. Dilip shifts the stall to the hospital food court. He prices plain dose at 40 and masal dose at 60. Yes, a small uptick in prices because he's going there. Maybe there are more costs attached to it. Maybe that place can easily uh, stomach that cost. However, two months on, he's serving only about 150 dosas per day, which is a pain point. Right? He's getting he has 5,000 people coming in there and he's the only guy serving dosas. Maybe, maybe he should be making more. The clientele is mostly the same hospital staff members who had been his customers before he moved to the food court. Now, this is the pain. You know, the same guys, he's selling half the volume at a slightly higher price. So half his guys are feeling that his dosas have now become more expensive. Which is all right if you lose your natural clientele, but get an additional clientele because you've shifted positioning, that's fine. But if you've lost half, if you've kind of not lost, if you've lost half the market, and you're you're not seeing an uptick, a pick up from somewhere else, then you're in trouble. Your numbers don't add up. And so, if all those guys came, then he's happy. If new guys came and doubled his market or grew his market a little bit, or even if this market remained the same but price point is higher, he's happy. Now he's in a little bit of trouble who had been his main customers before he moved to the food court. Which of the following actions will best help the leap in increasing his sales. Add more varieties of dosas at higher price points and reduce plain and masala dosa prices to 45 and 25 and 40 respectively. This may work. This may work. I like this because one, 25 and 40, my price sensitive regular customers who seem to be not visiting my place, they'll be back. They should be back. So. They're, they're, see, obviously the food court is comfortable, right? Instead of going down, I go to a more upmarket posh place. The so chances are his daily number of 300 to 400 from hospital staff shrunk to about 150. He lost 50% plus of the share because of the price communication, with the price point issue. So, slash the prices, they're back. Right? That's one, one way to prove. But this is a place that can warrant a higher price point. That is clear. That is clear. So it's very clear that anything else is priced at 200 bucks. So he's, this is a, you're inside. So you can do, I won't call it price gouging, but you can price higher. But you need to have an entry offering, which is your regular bread and butter, which is priced well. And premium offering, juicier offering where people come, people come with a couple of kids who say, look, I want a Szechuan dosa, I want a chocolate dosa. Have, make it a dosa corner rather than a plain dosa, masal dosa pot. So for, you offer something at a higher price point for a bunch of people who might want that variety and keep your regular client intact by doing a, the, the run of the mill stuff. Maybe the mix will give him the growth. Cater to his home ground without compromising on price. Expand by increasing variety. Maybe that's the best way to go. And so that, that could be interesting. Introduce a South Indian meal exclusively for the hospital staff members at a discounted rate of 40 per plate. This could work, but I think it, it, it can't be something that he does straight away. And a South Indian meal might open up a lunch market apart from a breakfast market, a whole new product range. Right? But he's a he's a dosa stall guy, so the communication will be will be tricky. And this fund of discounted rate of 40 per staff plate for hospital staff members, that becomes tricky. If he's catering only to hospital staff members, then he probably need not have been at the food court. He could have been downstairs at the at the gate and he would have been through. So I, the, the, the idea of, a, of an additional thing like but a discounted rate specifically for hospital thing even this straight away without really arresting his market share is something else. He needs to get his home territory done and then he can, he can go to new town. Right? So little worried about this. Introduce a North Indian meal and give a discount of 20% to the hospital staff members. No, 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 no. Your, your, your any business idea is going to be a function of competency and opportunity. The chances are both are not good on this one. Everybody else is selling North Indian food. So there's no opportunity for a new North Indian stall. Your competence is probably making dosa. Why would you want that? Leave that. Increase price of all food items by 50% and introduce a new Szechuan dosa at 200 a plate. The problem with this is, is your price point goes up. But, but you're already struggling with volumes crashing. This 150 goes to 70. Even if your revenues are good, you're in trouble. You're catering to 300 customers. If you're going to go to 70, you're in trouble. So th th he'll become a guy who, who, who milks the floating customer base and completely loses a regular bread and butter audience. 
in an ideal world your bread and butter audience is super crucial so if you don't have bread and butter audience then you're in trouble this might kill this bread and butter audience and have only the look people are milling about they look around and then say okay dosa ye bhi try kar leta hu time so only that will remain but our man and bunch of the other food court providers might not have a home ground he has he is a dosa stall guy who has got this credibility from hospital staff members who knows his stuff they love him already so he wouldn't want to compromise that but this could completely kill that therefore i'm not such a big fan of this reduce price by 20% for hospital staff and increase the price by 50% for others this is very uh, one of those excel sheet ideas hospital staff love you you need to retain them put that others i am catering to them let them come and pay it is one of those ideas which is super tricky to implement if the company will come and make an order it will be like show me your id tum kahan se ho i can't think of, i or you serve very clearly that uh, people will get to know that there's a price tag for hospital staff and price tag for non hospital staff that's in the wrong communication so it's one of those things that looks beautiful on on excel sheet where it says look this is our core audience deliver to them well our non core audience deliver to them at a higher price point all good but this one price point is almost double of the other then there's going to be dissonance all over the place your ops are going to go for a toss every chance that hospital staff market is retained the others completely killed and you don't want that either this is pretty much this cut prices maintain your regular hospital staff with dosa and masal dosa cater to some others who are price sensitive as well attack the more paying thing with variety go for this on the first anniversary of his stall at the food court dilip reviews his customer base almost all of his customers are the hospital staff members nice though he wishes to serve the general visitors at the hospital they avoid his stall if any because our man has a dosa stall it's very different on inquiry he reserves and discovers that visitors generally avoid the stall because it is majorly frequented by the hospital staff members giving it a feel of a staff canteen ah very snobbish i want to be served by the hospital staff people i want them to be my doctors my nurses handle my uh, unwell relatives and friends take care of my parents parents and grandmothers but i will not break bread with them and it's a very snooty customer base up market hospital they want to go to the food court and eat and not see nurses and doctors and so i'm just kidding but they don't want to be seen in a staff canteen and so dilip realizes his best efforts have not given him any extra sales and the visitors can potentially increase his revenue by a considerable amount so he needs to figure out now to reposition himself he need he should not be seen as a staff canteen that's a priority which of the following options can best help dilip in discouraging hospital staff members from visiting his stall while increasing his overall revenue provide a discount to those hospital staff members who order on phone and deliver food in their shop i really like this my problem is not i want to retain them and that customer base is important for me i want to make life happy for them i want to make sure only one thing that they don't turn up here i want them i don't want to dissuade them you you you, you have a strategy where you want to chase new new customers by screwing over your existing customers it won't survive you need your existing customers and then new audience without creating dissonance this is brilliant because i are basically saying your 10% extra sir i'll deliver it to you your your door step it help me plan please order half an hour extra it it will come there karma karma i'll deliver it to you probably they like it good deal they don't have to climb up and down it will come to their places it takes an extra cost for them it makes sure that there's a cost of delivering and there's a additional price point in discounting this incentivizes them to order but the the market opportunity because he's keeping the staff members away from the away from the area could be significant i already like this appeal to the hospital management to give a space in the staff room where an exclusive dosa counter can be set up by dilip the pain that you're going to go to speak to management you effectively saying i'll create a staff canteen i thought it's not an easy decision to make for them uh, if you create that staff canteen then you have to run two places that's a pain you have to have somebody else run this somebody else run this they might still be peeved. like staff canteen is poor dosa there it is better dosa i i don't want to have two establishments i don't want to do root anything through hospital management and create a new avenue no no not a fan not the worst idea but not a fan it is a massive discount on price for the next two months to increase the football nice idea but no nuance not even a nice idea on second thoughts you do this staff canteen people who already love you are going to come they're going to even their friends are going to come who are also nurses and doctors they going to have good fun they going to eat their place is going to get branded as a staff canteen probably 
you go to you, you don't have a problem with people not liking your food you don't have a problem with price sensitivity you not come there yet they look at this and say so many nurses and doctors that's a staff canteen area already they are poking needles on me let me go somewhere else that's what they are thinking so so no not this easy charge the hospital staff members a premium to offset the losses due to their presence ha <laughs> no 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 definitely no this is your core clientele these are people who love you who, who, who visited you when you were at the basement who come here and patronize you you have a specific group of patrons who want to chase a new business you find a way to do it you can't chase a new business by saying look i'll start treating you badly i'll charge a premium for you just to make sure you don't come here no 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 i want them i want them to eat but i want to change the perception this does it brilliantly no request a hospital management to prohibit hospital staff a core market you will kill that what for so it is between a and b a is so much better go for choice a which is this sundareshan was the professor of corporate responsibility at a premium management institution as a requirement of his course students had to synthesize sustainability challenges faced by thermal power companies and submit an assignment on them nice csr project and discuss about that so it was an individual assignment some students sought permission from sundareshan to work on the assignment as a team they said look we want to work in a group of two or three it's actually is a rather important point we'll come back to this sundareshan knew that collaboration fosters peer learning and therefore allowed them to work in teams look if you, you work in teams maybe you, you get value from each other go right ahead however he minded that the team should not exceed 3 members like otherwise there'll be a bunch of free riders taking their own sweet time while 15 students elected to work individually 15 formed teams of 3 each and another 10 formed teams of 2 members each 15 worked on their own 5 into 3 5 into 2 15 one member teams 5 3 member teams and 5 2 member teams nice equally split but not equally split more or less there as assignment deadline came closer sundareshan was approached by abbas varram who chose to work in a team of 3 members he informed sundareshan that venkamma the team member distressed by the death of her grandmother could not work on her bit of the assignment abbas requested for a deadline extension so that she could finish her part of the assignment by then many students who were working alone had already submitted their assignments so, This is a question which I got caught in rather badly because I didn't take in all the information really well. And the bunch of things that are very important. Several students have already submitted, so he is coming in rather late with this. And so, uh, assignment as assignment deadline came closer, probably a 30 day deadline. He is coming with three days to go. And so rather late on this. I didn't grab this. This part especially accentuated the thing. some because of some of them have already submitted right so she is coming late in the day it's important second thing to it was an individual assignment some students sought permission from sundareshan not like it was designed as a group it was designed for each person to be done individually and then some members said look we will form groups of 3 or 2 sundareshan said okay okay do it kar kar and this part is the most crucial some have already submitted is coming late in the day which two things that i completely missed which of the following actions by sundareshan is the most appropriate given the circumstances give the students a deadline extension but add an extra assignment for the team as a new requirement so basically say okay i'll give you four more days but complete a little bit more and so i like this because you're being kind to the students it's a group project and then one person is not able to pull their weight because of some something that that came up the other two are not able to cover for this person and therefore give them a little bit more uh, extension but say hey i'm giving you an extension but i need something more from you guys give them something extra i like that option disband the team and ask each student to work individually late in the day to do that becomes they form the team they should deliver as a team they agreed for this they signed up for this so i'm not going to say break everything up and start all over again so not a not a fan because it's late in the day it's very clear that for a large enough deadline or small enough time is remaining some students have already submitted i don't want to disband it and say all of each of you submit alone because the three members might have been might have depended on somebody else to deliver something for them they're going to end up submitting the same project in some patch patch form so I'll, i don't think that's a that's a viable solution one abast that such issues 
such issues should not be flagged to the professor and should be handled within the team. I, I like this one Abbas, it's very strong. It's basically the professor saying, look, I don't give a damn. You said you'll work as a team of, tea, team of three. You give me the assignment. You give me the assignment three days from now. I don't care what happened to your team of three. This is not my problem to solve. I didn't like this because it was rather severe. Right. Give extra time to Venkamma to work individually and ask the other two to stick to the original deadline as a team. This again I worried because it's a team project. How do you then say, okay, the two of you give me something and the third one gives something else? If, I, I, if it's a team project, it's a team project. If it's an individual project, it's an individual project. Having a team project and having two people submit, the third one doing that, then their accountability as a team is completely removed. So they are basically doing one third of a project each. That's not what it is. A three member team committed to deliver as a three member team. And then saying you deliver one third of the project each, that's like neither here nor there. So to disband the team, break the team up, work individually, keep separately. No, 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 not a fan. Extend a deadline for the team while imposing a one grade penalty for deadline extension. Well, this, this I like. Look, you might have come as a team, you might have had extenuating circumstances, you come late in the day and you're basically saying one person didn't turn up. I would have liked it if they'd been given a choice. You can either get an extension with a one grade penalty or deliver and submit on time and see where it takes you. And so, uh, a one grade penalty for the deadline extension seems a trade-off. Some people have already submitted. If I gave them an extension, I'm being unfair to the bunch of people who have already submitted. People who have been done the job all on their own, completed it, delivered it. As it is a group of three projects, uh, is some leeway granted by the professor to some student. They are a group of three. And then you are giving them an extra leeway. So there should be some strings attached to it. The one grade penalty seems alright. Instead of a B, you will get a C. Instead of an A, you will get a B. So whatever grade you would have otherwise got, minus one is what you will get. And so this seemed fair. So for me, it was between A and E. But then, uh, on second reading and noticing this, the answer actually turned out to be C. Then, uh, in hindsight, after having seen the answer, I'm, I was rather convinced that this should work because these guys wanted a team of three. These guys committed to it. This guy has come very late, very clear. It's an assignment deadline approach. And then he's saying one of them couldn't contribute. So one way is turning up very late and throwing one teammate under the bus and saying that's why they can't deliver. The professor has no obligation to be considerate towards this. No need. Three people, one person is not turning up. Another two of you maintain, you form the three-member team, deliver it to me. I, it's a three-member team. I gave individual assignments. You put this lid on top of yourself and saying, look, treat all three of us together. And then you come back and say, the three of us are not together. It's not a group assignment where I designed the team members and A was saddled with B and K. No, no, no. You guys told me that instead of doing it individually, we'll do it as a group of three. Then you face up to whatever you want to face up to. You cannot come back to me and say this group of three is not working because one person is in trouble. If there were severe extenuating circumstances, I will think about it, provided I was given this information well in advance. Some people have submitted it. It's very unfair to give leeway. It is, it is submitted and not, that, not likely that some submitted in day one. They have accounted for their thing. They have submitted that individually. They have completed it and given it up. Submitted, given to, to, to him. So there is some mechanism by which others have been able to manage their time, team, everything. And so there is no obligation from the professor to provide any extra leeway to them. And so this deadline extension and an extra assignment, no, no, why? Cut it one grade and say extend the deadline, why? I have my coursework, I have my plan. The three of you committed to saying you will do this. On the two days to go on a 20 day project, you're coming and telling me that one of the people were not, was not ready. That's your problem, not mine. This is actually correct. I was very considerate and kind and I thought, hey, maybe one of these two will work. There is no obligation from the professor to say, okay, I'll go the extra mile because you are struggling. No, no, no. For a team that you form, the three of you will form a team and you will deliver. You committed to this. You created the idea of a team when I said it was an individual assignment. And then there is an extenuating circumstance. You cover for it. There are three of you. One person has an extenuating circumstance. The other two cover because it's the team that you formed. You come very late in the day, no chance, it skips. If I give them an extension, then I have to, it is extra burden for me. I'll have to grade all of these papers, then see their paper after four days, then grade everything, give the grades. No, I don't want to do that. 
give them an extension, give them a new requirement, I'll have to correct all that. No, no, no obligation. This is a rule, stick by it. Don't come and talk to me. It is actually very reasonable that the professor goes for this option. When Sundaresan was about to create the assignment, she received a request from the class representative regarding the students who worked individually. The request was to give those students additional marks because they handled the entire workload. This would improve their course grade significantly. This is important. Some people said I'll work in groups of two. Some have said I'll work in groups of three. Others have said, look, I'm doing it all on my own. As a professor, I can account for the fact that a group of three projects should be slightly better than a group of one. One person project or two person project. A group of two should be slightly better than a group of one. Right? I can account for that while I'm correcting. But it's also important that individually the guys who submitted, they can feel aggrieved what they delivered, all the work end to end they did, but these groups of two or three fellows had some leaving. Right? But the one thing that I didn't like about this is the request from the class representative regarding students who worked individually, it is not done prior to submission, it's done post submission. It's like saying, look, I'm fixing an error post facto. I don't like that. The rules of the game should have been defined straight away. If they had said, look, some are working alone, some are working in groups of two, some are working in groups of three. You either tell us that the expectations are different or you say group of one will get extra credit or individual team will get extra credit on day one, day two, the rules are defined. Very happy. This is a legitimate claim. If it is done pre-submission, way pre-submission, so I need to have a choice. Say, Shall I work individually, take everything on myself and get extra credit? work in a group of two or three, hide somewhere, don't, don't do everything all on my own and take a hit. Then it's a choice that people are given and they make it. Right now, it is post facto, after I submitted, if I had been a guy who was said, look, group of one, group of two, I can work really well, I am really good at this, my friend is really good at this, we create a kick-ass output and submit it, the professor should be impressed overall, both of us should get good grades. That's how I'm thinking, if I'm working in a group of two. Later on, you come and tell me if you had worked as one, you would have got a better grade. I don't want that. This, 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 this information cannot be given to me after my submission. I have an issue with that. Right? Which of the following is the most appropriate action by Sundaresan to mark the assignment? Divide the total marks awarded to a different number of team members. Brutal, cruel, can't happen. Then it's effectively a significant improvement for all one member teams. Post factor. They've been told this first day, okay, everybody would have been individual and said goodbye and taken it. Reduce marks for those who worked in teams by 10%. Again, post facto. All reasonable, but post facto. Treat both individual work and team work equally. Yeah, this is what I committed to. I cannot change the rules of anything after the fact. So maybe this is where I'll, I'll go towards. Give 10% extra marks to all those who worked individually. Reduce marks for those who worked in teams by 10%. Give 10% extra marks to all those who worked. B and T are same leaving out 1.1 and 0.9 and how they are different. Convert the assignment to a non-graded assignment because both the individuals and the teams worked on the same assignment. This is meh, like I won't even grade it. No, no, people committed to being graded. They did it, they did the work. No. Choice C. And through this set, I got this feeling that anytime you're talking about uh, professors and students, it, is, it, it conveys a message that look, rules we agreed to are important. Being clear in communication, settling for one is important. Solving your problems on your own after you have committed is important. Being accountable for the decisions you take and the team you own up to and being a part of that is important. So see it is. Everything gets treated equally. No special, no, no changing stuff later on. Okay. Sundaresan was going through the submitted assignments. Team 9 with 3 members had impressive exhibits and charts. Later he discovered that team 13 with 3 members also had the same exhibits and charts. Very interesting. Either one or both of them have cheated. He realized that one of the teams had copied from the other. Hence, he informed both the teams that he would award an F grade to both the teams for copying. Later that evening, Ashi from Team 9 called and admitted to sharing exhibits and charts with Anvi of Team 13. Further, she mentioned that Anvi could not put enough efforts since she lost, lost significant amount of time due to COVID-19. Thereafter, Anvi requested for help. However, Anvi assured Ashi that she would not reproduce the shared content. Ashi requested Sundaresan to punish her and Anvi and spare others as they were not involved. Thank you. Beautiful question. Thank you. Beautiful question. Who shares blame? How should blame be apportioned? Is it only 
Ashi's fault for being stupid enough to share a chart. It's only Anvi's fault for saying, I'll just copy and reproduce the whole thing. Are the others culpable? The, the two members of this team, two members of that team. Right? Which is the following action by Sundaresan is the most appropriate. Punish both the teams by giving F grades. I don't, I'm not going to go into this part of who copied from whom. I found two reports being two being replicas of each other. One of you, either both of you have worked together, collaboration, both are crappy, both get F. X has copied from Y. X has copied unethical zero. Y has been naive enough to share and let this copying happen unethical zero. If it is found out that X copied from Y without their knowledge, then we have a case. I mean, Y has submitted. X has done some backdoor stealing thing, some corporate espionage level stuff. That's not what has happened. One group is unethical, other group is stupid enough to allow unethical stuff. Therefore, both get F grades. I'm not getting into this debate. One option. So, so an option to be considered, but super proven. I want an F grade to both Ashi and Anvi and spare others. And so, basically saying, look, you two are responsible. You two did this. You two have confessed. Uh, so, I'm letting the others go. And so, again, reasonable. Because they have come back, come here and confessed this. And others are not to blame. Ashi has shared it with Anvi. She has copied without being careful about it. And they've come out and said, look, only we did this. Others had no role to play. Ask both the teams to work on an extra assignment to avoid an F grade. This is fine, but this is kind of like condoning copying and B schools are super severe in it. And so sometimes I get stunned when I see the, the standards outside of uh, academia. Sometimes I get stranded in standards seen in academia outside of college settings. And this might come as news. Colleges are super brutal about plagiarism. And outside people are not. People willy nilly copy content and do all kinds of bullshit. And so I get stunned. We've been at the wrong end of the stick on plagiarism. I have rather strong views on this. But content is sacrosanct. What you do is very clear. So this seems like you can you're condoning this. And maybe even the real world will do it. Not not academia. Not academia. You, you can't say, look, I copied, but hey, we'll do one more assignment and Let's pretend we didn't copy. No, no, no. You can't pretend we didn't copy. It's not a mistake. It's not a shoddy report. It's a, it's a transgression. It's a crossing a line. Right? Punish Anvi with an F grade and spare others. With a version of this. I don't know. I keep getting confused with names. And let me see who's copying, who's not. Ashi is the original and Anvi has copied. So Anvi has copied, give her an F grade and spare others. Ashi has been naive enough to share. I don't think she should. She, she, she gets away scot-free. So, so no, no. Spare both the teams as such a confession is that no academy is never going to look at it like that. Confession is probably look. If I punish you, then I punish you. If I, if, I, if you confess, then I punish you five percent less, not hundred percent left. And this is a serious issue. So, an ethical transgression and, and plagiarism is super serious. They'll, they'll throw the book at you. And so. So the, uh, the, the answer, correct answer is this, A. And the, the learnings for me was that anything which is an ethical issue, anything which is where plagiarism is involved, anything where, where copying, stealing, doing some, some sly, slimy things are involved, there is practically no room to make a distinction. And as far as teamwork is given, involved and accountability is there, the team is a unit. The previous question in this one, super clear. It tells. I think, I think, I think Anwar saying, look, your team is your team. Don't come and talk to me about it. So the professor does not want to make a distinction between three members of a team. He does not want to say Ashi, Alpha and Beta are there. Ashi has made the mistake, not Alpha and Beta. No, no, it's your team. I'm looking at you as a team X. So I cannot make a distinction between grades given to three members of team X. Accountability, responsibility, your, your, your ownership is to the team. There's no, no demarking or, or marketing different members in a team. Accountability is shared and with everybody. That's what they're telling us. There's no room for uh, being light on ethical transgressions. So, and shoddy report, mark being cut, grade being cut. All right. But copying, not all right. You're not, you're not having that discussion. You've copied, you're dead. The three people in a group, one person has copied, all three are dead. One group has copied from another, both groups are dead. Three members in this group, three members in that group, all six are dead. I'm not having this discussion. Is what this is saying. That's probably a beautiful learning to take. An ethical transgression, you get the book thrown at you. 
no room for leeway there is a group all members in the group are individually responsible for the entire group action there is no leeway there either and so one group is punished for copying one group is punished for being stupid enough to let the copying happen both groups are punished not individuals in the group being treated differently that's a learning at least that's the learning i got from here therefore i wanted to put this seat in because to that, that take away this is crystal clear ethical transgression no leeway whatsoever group being held responsible no distinction between different members in a group you're a group you live and die as a group Head said A to Z is a state funded leading engineering college in the country renowned for its teaching and placements now A to Z aspires to be a global leader in research as well A to Z has therefore decided to push for better quality research from its newly recruited faculty members in the past a few faculty members were confirmed because of their exceptional teaching feedback even though their research output was below par currently the dean in consultation with the academic council has included the quality of research as a mandatory requirement along with teaching excellence for the confirmation of newly recruited faculty members the academic council comprises senior faculty members from different departments nice right. so they were they were uh, they had faculty members they were a leading company they are state funded they are doing well uh, but they they want to be global so they've set out their stall to say hey we want research as well and then they're saying uh, we will not when we are confirming people if they are the teachers if the students love them that's not enough for us we still going to nudge them prod them push them to say hey we need to have good uh, research as well a singular quality of research is a mandatory requirement along with teaching excellence this 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 word mandatory requirement not an optional feature not a can have but a must have yes, so that, that's what they're thinking about uh, you're going towards new territory you're saying look i'm going to i want to be a global leader and therefore research plays an important role for me you want to set expectations new guys are coming in they will be confirmed only after checking out their research as well probably see the, what's what else is there initially newly recruited faculty members are put on a probation for 3 years either they are confirmed or their probation is extended or their services are terminated based on teaching and research contribution they say yes no maybe once confirmed their job is secure along with other additional prerequisites or other, other parts they have along with other additional whatever they get aparna joined the social sciences department of a to z 2 years back she is amongst the many faculty member recruited after the new norms for confirmation were introduced this is after it was told very clearly or the norm include research she completed her doctorate from a reputed university in the us with a significant research contribution however after joining a to z aparna got deeply involved in social outreach as covid 19 was spreading Though her social outreach has given her immense satisfaction, she has nothing to show against research contributions. For that, it has impacted her teaching effectiveness. Her confirmation is due in a year. Nice, very interesting. So, Aparna comes with a good reputation, a good college, and she's done research in her life. But now, this is COVID-19 spreading, and she has stepped in to do social activities. Can probably a good cause. Probably she's doing good job, good work there. having said that her research has suffered so too perhaps as, as her teaching wonderful interesting let's see the questions from here on the dean during the annual appraisal of aparna realizes that her research contribution needs considerable investment of time and effort he sees it and says look you've done chat got to be careful he is concerned that her performance could set a wrong precedent for the new faculty recruits the dean wants to communicate to the new faculty recruit that research contribution is critical he can't have one person slipping under the radar he cannot afford to have uh, a few people not taking research seriously if that happens the next cycle more people start taking research lightly and then 3 years from now we are back to where we started where research is not so important we just a teaching college so he is worried about that uh, the dean wants to communicate to the new faculty recruit that research contribution is critical important which of the following actions will best help the dean in achieving the objective while being fair to aparna appreciate aparna social outreach but advise her to focus on research and teaching contribution as they are essential for confirmation yeah i like this i already like this say you are not belittling what you do it's, it's good I, i actually like that you are going out and doing but hey our rules are our rules you've got to be careful you cannot say i'm doing stuff on covid therefore my teaching and research take a back seat you simply cannot afford to do that you have to don the hat of a of a covid-19 activist or social research social worker 
and the hat of a teacher and researcher. So you've got to justify your role or justify your uh, contribute uh, what, what you are effectively doing in both definitions as one as a social contributor and as a professor teacher here. Extend Aparna's probation period by an additional year while reminding her about the research and teaching contributions needed for confirmation. Like this as well. Give her one more year because she's been it's been a tough time, COVID. Uh, and she has done something else. So it's not a no, maybe she can contribute, maybe she is good at teaching, maybe she will do her research. She can't get by without doing research and, uh, and or teaching, but she can be given one more year. An extension is not a confirmation. It's just saying, hey, you got one more year to earn your, earn your checks. I like that as well. Suggest Aparna to start looking for a new job in the time available to her. No, the, we can't shut the door uh, because we, the question clearly says being fair, fair to Aparna. There's one more year, so you can, you can, you can buckle up. She's from a reputed university, is capable, probably uh, has things going for her potentially if she can pull up her socks. So somebody is to say, hey, you can't just become this person, you need to teach and do research as well. In a firm yet kind way, that's the requirement. Not say, hey, look, chalo niklo. So, so I'm not such a big fan of this. Exhort Aparna to suspend her social outreach activities till the end of her probation and to focus on research and teaching instead. It's probably nudge her to this, but it's not my job to say, don't do the other thing. So if I'm a friend, a, 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 a brother, a, a, maybe even a colleague, a father, somebody can say, look, you need to balance. I don't think you can maintain both. Chuck this, keep this on hold for a year, get your confirmation, then think about this. But if I'm a, the dean, that's not my job to say what you should not be doing in your social circle, personal life. I can only say, hey, you need to be doing this. If you are really good and you can balance both, maybe you should do both. And so, but it's not my job to say, focus on research and teaching instead. Leave that and come here. I don't think so. Increase her teaching and research requirements while extending her probation period by two years. The probation period extending is fine. But why should she serve a higher bar, increase her teaching and research requirements? Say, you've got to do more now. I'm not so sure about that. I'm not so sure that, uh, that, the, the, that she has missed her chance. There's still one more year left. I would want to go towards an option where I remind her of her responsibilities, remind her of what she signed up for as a teacher professor, and then say, hey, give this a go. Don't let this be sacrificed because you're doing the other thing, as important as that might be. And so increasing her requirements, I'm not so sure. I would I would settle between A and think between A and B. Appreciate, but advise her to focus on research and teaching contribution as they're essential for confirmation. It's still one more year, mind you. If this were we're having this discussion with three weeks to go, then I'm probably nudging towards this. It's one more year. I don't need to <coughs> already extend the probation by an additional year. One more year to go, she can prove herself, she can. Uh, she can pull up her socks. If things are not up to speed, even then, then I can think about this option. Uh, but there's still one more year. I would want to give her a chance to get confirmed in three years. I don't want to already take the decision that it has to be extended by a year. I appreciate her. But to all intents, it seems to be a crucial thing. It is a, an exceptional year. So this seems to be something that's, that's working. So I don't want to... I want to definitely hey, say that's good. I understand. I understand that's important. I understand you're doing that. But hey, tell you what, you, I know you are capable of delivering on this. I need you to pull up your socks on teaching and research. You still have got a year more. Go for it. Finish that off. Try to do more of teaching and research this year because it's absolutely crucial for you. I would go for this. CDE eliminate themselves easier. Between A and B, I like A. One year on, Aparna continues with her social work. Nice. Gradually, she gets closer to the end of her probation and she has not much to show against her teaching and research contribution. Now the ship has sailed. However, her social work has been widely appreciated by the local media. Nice. The chief minister of the state wants Aparna to take a larger role in social outreach and assist the government. Nice. She's, she's clearly, evidently making a big impact. Just not in her original role. The dean is afraid that not confirming Aparna might prompt her to leave the institution, sending a wrong signal to the outside world. She's doing a good job. At this point in time, we fire her and say, hey, I don't care about your social outreach. 
get out here it like um, um, like a like a wonderful potential uh, olympic champion not being given time off by the school to to practice to get a bronze medal or a gold medal or a silver medal for the country i think so you, it's important that the other things also play a role i'm not saying the school should sacrifice itself and then later have a, a, a free reign but we need to find something where we can we can find some balance cut her some slack or at least that's what he's is worried that not conforming her will look bad and it might perhaps not be the best course of action either not just look bad however he also wants to send a message to the newly joined faculty members that teaching and research contributions are essential for confirmation super i think this spell has set it up nicely so i'm i'm going to pick a choice which doesn't kick her out and that's not confirm her so um, the, this whole thing is set up screaming for probation extension i don't want to kick her out I don't want to. She's doing some good job. I want to cut her some slack. Having said that, if I confirm her, it basically means if you're a great social worker, you can become a professor here. If you play cricket really well, you can become a professor here. If you if you get here, if you can get the chief minister's say so on something, then you can be here for anything. That just sends all kinds of wrong signals to the faculty member. So, the choice I'm looking for straight away is probation extension. Let me look at that. confirm a parna but freeze her increments and proportions until her research contributions are as per the expected chance so the moment you confirm then you are automatically saying my research requirements can take a back seat i don't want to take the confirm option offer to create a non teaching position of outreach officer for aparna but terminate her from the teaching position this is a fudge so basically fire her without calling it as a firing and she'll probably get an outreach officer role from the from the government So this not so juicy. This not so juicy. Let's keep looking. Offer Aparna a five-year contractual position after which she has to leave, irrespective of her contributions. Why? Why? If suppose you give her an option and then she start doing well, she's got a, she's got probably a twenty-five year academic career ahead of her. She could do well. Why should you sign up a contract which is at the end of five years you're out? It was a teaching profession. Not a fan. Extend Aparna's probation by three years and tell her that she would have to leave for research and training. Teaching do not improve in that period. Seems reasonable. Extend probation. Give her a longer rope. Give it three years, and say, "Hey, you're finally in this place. You have to become a professor. Research and teaching matter. No matter what your other other roles you don, this is crucial. I cannot confirm you or I cannot elevate you without that. Having said that." uh there are extenuating circumstances you have been doing something super meaningful i can't see that that is uh, that, that is making an impact therefore i'll cut you some slack and give you three more years so, so i'm liking this declare that aparna's extraordinary achievement deserves to be treated exceptionally and confirm her straight away i don't like this this word also this word declare and so sometimes we do this oh, so brilliant so screw the rules the rules are not for you and uh, the, the passage clearly outlined that the dean wants to be very clear he has aspirations he wants to set the bar he says he wants to send a message are essential for contribution teaching and research are essential for confirmation if you do this you're basically saying they're essential for confirmation but i tell you what you can get confirmed even without that it's all exactly the wrong thing so i think d it is you would go with d A few months later, Aparna, during an interview with the local media, inadvertently expresses her fear that she might be let go by A to Z because she has not met its teaching and research requirements. She's a little, she's a little worried, and it comes through. Maybe I can't continue as a professor because I'm, I've not had enough time to to do my research. Consequently, the academic council urges the dean to review the faculty confirmation policy. They come back and say, "Hey, we can't afford to lose her. She, she's a good person. Let's, let's review it." The dean, however, believes that any change in the policy will be a setback to the institute's aspirations of becoming a global leader in research. You understand? Set the bar. Other people are probably publishing research. You're just pulling the rug from under their feet. Which of the following actions by the dean will be the most appropriate given the circumstances? Convey to Aparna that the institute is eager to retain her. However. Emphasize that she should focus on research to get confirmed. Yeah, I like this because she's just tough, right? The, the institute has not said, "Look, you're out." She's not saying that. Call her over and say, "Hey, we like you. We can't simply can't confirm you without research. So do make sure that you keep your head above water. Publish some research. Make sure that you you can this 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 role. Uh, you fulfill the basic requirements of this job. So keep think about that." 
tell Aparna that she's being let go for insulting the college on a public platform. No, he wants to find a solution. He just want, doesn't want to burn bridges and say, hey, look, get out of here. Give an interview to a local newspaper and share Aparna's lack of research and poor teaching feedback. This is like washing dirty linen in public. No. Confirm Aparna, but ask her to issue a public statement acknowledging the importance A to Z gives to research contribution. Look, the importance given by A to Z to research contributions is for other teachers to feel it, the new recruits to feel it. Not for the world to think that A to Z as it's not a PR exercise. It's an actual message. If you're, if you're a CEO, and you want to convey a particular message to your employees that employees are important. You can't fire 1000 people and then say my employees are very important. No, no, it is an internal message and it's got to be consistency. If you confirm her and don't care about it, then press release from her, just hollow. Confirm Aparna, but make it clear that her future promotions will be tied to her research contribution and teaching feedback. No, no, no. You cannot say, look, I'm letting you go this time, but hey, tell you what, five years from now, if it continues, you are in trouble. No, 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 no. You can assuage her fears. Tell her that, hey, we are, we are eager. We want you here. Uh, but, but see if you can find that balance. Give her some more chance. Give her a longer rope. Tell her extension of probation. Give, facilitate the process. Make it work. Give her some more time to come back and complete her research. Give what, what research people to publish in, in, in six months, give her nine months, give her 10 months. Ask her to, to, to refocus on this. Give her another chance to grab on and, and, and deliver on, on whatever promise she may have. So this is something that works with her. And, and, and I like that, not the other four. Choice A, I would go for.